Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, yeah, so uh, let's just start off with a couple of thanks here to get it rolling. If the slides work, there we go. Awesome. Firstly, I want to say thank you to GDC for inviting me. Thank you to the organizers of the Indie Summit for putting this whole thing on and finding such great speakers. Kate Compton's talk, last one. If you saw it, that was amazing. Um, so I want to say hi, I'm Matter. I'm a professor, as mentioned, from NHTV University in the Netherlands. It's an awesome place to study. If you want to learn about video games in Europe, you should be going there. Uh, I'm a games developer. I ran my own company called Matterzone for seven years as an indie developer. Uh, I made games for myself, for the web, for friends, and for companies like MTV2 and Channel 4. Uh, after that, I went to join people like EA and Rebellion, uh, working on a few different titles for them, where I was a writer, narrative designer, uh, lead designer in the very end, uh, before I went off to work on other things. Most recently, I released Fragments of Him last year on Xbox One and PC in collaboration with an awesome couple of guys at a studio called Sassybot. So uh, that's an emotional storytelling kind of game. Uh, it was nominated for the best writing in a video game by the Writers Guild of Great Britain, uh, where since I'm now a full member and a member of the video game committee, uh, I also consult and train people in narrative design. I do more stuff. I'm writing books about, oh God. Anyway, I basically do game stuff. Uh, and I have done for my entire adult life. So I'm going to be talking to you today uh, about why understanding story structures is a useful skill for games developers. And often it's actually something which is already done intuitively. So that's one of the interesting things about this, that a lot of stuff that I'm going to say, you can go, oh yeah, we, we kind of already do some of that. And it's a way of me moving that into kind of a conscious realm. We're going to look at a, a reliable story, storytelling structure that you can use, which will help you tell stories, uh, and some debug questions to help you fix stories or gameplay that feels unrewarding. Uh, there's going to be two takeaway diagrams at the very, very end of this session. So after I've said thank you at the very, very end, there'll be two pictures which you can take a photo of, and it'll give you loads of summary information about the things I've been saying today. So we're going to talk about how to build those, and there's a nice, easy takeaway for you if you want to bring up a camera right at the end there. This is a lot to cover, so I'm going to be talking fast. The key points are going to be on the screen behind me. I have an English accent. Not all of you are native English speakers, uh, so if you can't uh, follow too easily, if you look at the screen, you're going to get all the main points as we go. So let's start off talking a little bit about flowing games. This is something that we all understand is important. We usually express this as a diagram where we've got challenge on one and skill on the other. And if it's, uh, if it's got very low skill, uh, sorry, very high skill requirement but low challenge, then a game becomes quite boring. And if it's got a low, low skill but high challenge, then the game becomes too difficult. It makes players really anxious. So we decide really that we should try and keep people what's called the flow channel. Now, we started off thinking that this was kind of a straight line, that challenge and skills should escalate in perfect relationship to each other. But we've discovered, really, that it's kind of more fun if, it, if this kind of wavy, wobbly line that, as we go along there. Now, if you want to learn more about flow, there's some great people you can uh, read up on. Genova Chen, Jesse Shell, Mihaly Sixen Mihaly. Uh, he was the kind of guy who came up with a lot of this stuff. Um, tricky one to search for, just go Mahali and Flow, it will come out fine in Google. Um, these people have done amazing work on Flow, look it up. Now, when we think about storytelling uh, intention, we also can express this as a diagram, and we often do. So we often have tension along one side and time going along the bottom there from zero to 100% of our story. And as we go through, we have kind of the, the inciting incident, which is that first peak. We kind of have a low midpoint where things have got worse unexpectedly when we try to fix them. We have that final, what's called the black moment in writing, where there's kind of this moment of the greatest darkness threatens us, and then we eventually overcome it, which is the end of our story. Now, it's actually generally slightly more sort of knobbly than that, and I'll explain why it's a bit more knobbly than that in the, later on. But as you can see, when we could kind of compare these two ideas together, we see that there's still this thing there that if a lot of time's gone along and no tension happened, then it's quite boring. And if there's uh, a really high tension and not a lot of time's passed, then it feels too tense. It doesn't feel natural. And so we can see there's kind of this combination of the two that we have these things that go in common between them. Um, but really, what does that kind of wobbly line actually represent? What is this thing when we talk about games? What is, what is this thing going on here? Now, when we think about this, we could think about what is the story of your game? Now, we could kind of go, well, your game has things that we might call pre-authored content. 
So this is things like events and content, the storytelling, the, the, the mechanics, the world that it's in. These are things that we put into our games to tell the stories of them. On the other hand, we've got our players. Awesome, huge bunch of people, all of them playing, having fun with this kind of stuff. We could call this a user-generated version of the story. This is their interaction with the world, and it's their interpretation of the world. Because the world that we design might not be the world that they see, because they interpret things differently based on their experiences of playing games and the world around them. So between the two of these, we might get different things. So imagine we've got a world which has a car in it on a racetrack, and it's in the middle of a city, but we've already got a narrative setting there. We know about cars, we know about cities. And it starts off the race, and there's this back and forth between you and a rival, and then on the final bend is coming up, and the rival's just ahead, and that final corner, the rival doesn't drive particularly well, and you manage to take it on the inside. Fantastic excitement, lovely little story encapsulated in that moment there. That's a tiny little story within a game. And we can see that whether we think about tension in stories or whether we think of this as flow, this is basically a story. These, these two lines fit with this experience over here. Now, as, as developers, we shaped that through the AI. Maybe we did rubber banding on the AI to make sure that, that, that our opponent was close on that final bend, but stupid enough to crash just as we were taking past it there. We changed it with a track design to make sure that it was fun, that there was going to be straights and corners that felt exciting and built in this rhythm of a story as you played. And from a player's perspective, well, they were using their skill, their choices, their, their ways of controlling the corners to create that story for themselves. So these two things have basically created the player experience between them. This line, this story that they've created, this wobbly line is basically the, the place between these. And ideally, that's the thing that we make as games developers. We create that experience, we create that space for it, and we help our users get to that point. So how do we do this kind of stuff? So flow theory says that it's good to keep players in that flow channel. We know that that's a good place to keep them. But how do we do this? Well, there's lots of other ideas out there based on mechanics. But storytellers have structured systems that they've been reliably using to create great audience experiences for millennia. So rather than perhaps reinvent the wheel for understanding a player experience, we can learn a lot from storytellers in how they shape experiences, how they guide the emotional journey the players go on. So what we're going to do here is we're going to build in a diagram which covers the basics of storytelling. We're going to have a uh, little bit of stuff about motivations. We're going to have some stuff about scene structure. And a lot of it is going to be about a flow from beginning to end, mostly covering from 0 to 100%, with a little bit more and a little bit at the end. This whole diagram will be shown at the very, very end of this slide. So you don't need to take photos progressively as we go, by the way, unless you want to. Uh, and I'm also going to be filling in some information about what happens at each juncture there. So let's start off talking about motivations. This is a really key part of, of telling a good story. So for characters, these are divided between external and internal motivations. An external motivation is the desire to change something in the world outside you. So this is often to get richer, to steal some money from a bank, or become rich and famous through doing a particular thing. That's a, a very common external motivation. It changes your status in the outside world. Another one is to travel. You want to reach to a certain place. You want to explore a new area. That's a, that's a, a change in your uh, status in terms of your location. Forming friendships and love and relationships. It's changing your relationship status. It's a status in the outside world. Emotions are an internal thing in some ways, but how they affect the outside world is still an external motivation. So it could be to date the hot guy in the office, for example. That could be the objective of the game or for your character. So in terms of motivations here, an internal motivation is a desire to change something inside the person. This is usually a term like overcoming a problem, so overcome a block. It's often an emotional block, overcoming a sense of loneliness, overcoming uh, grief. Now, revenge is an external thing because you affect revenge on the outside world. Overcoming grief is the inside part of that. You try to overcome grief by killing people in the outside world. That's how a lot of video game plots work. Another internal motivation is learning something new. Usually it's something they should have already known. And you can succeed in one and fail in the other. And often when you succeed in external motivation and fail in internal motivation, you get a tragedy. That's Romeo and Juliet. Two families alike in dignity. 
who fail to actually ever come to terms with the fact that they should stop fighting. And their internal necessity to learn something new about themselves, to learn that they're all the same, to learn to accept their differences, and their failure to do that kills their children. And that's why that's a tragedy. So learning something new is a huge thing of an internal change there. Now, both of these things, like I say, they are about change. A story is always about change. A, cha a story that doesn't have change from beginning to end is a very, very boring story. Now, it can just be that your character got bigger guns. It's change of a kind, you know. And it works pretty well, it really does. Uh, I'm not putting down games which are just purely about mechanical advancement. That's a lot of fun as well. But there are other things we can do to change internally. So that change must happen in some kind. But how do we apply all this kind of stuff to games? Well, we might not think of Tetris as a game with the greatest of plots. But it really does follow these kind of things pretty well. It's a very, very compelling player experience. Now, if we think about this, if we think about kind of the tension arc that we go through when we're playing this, it fits that flow thing, it fits that tension arc. And the player has both external and internal goals. We have the scores as an external goal, and we have that internal goal, which is kind of a desire for order. Tetris is driven by the thing that we like the world to be slightly neater than it is. And this is a tiny place where maybe, just maybe, we'll succeed in making it happen. And it's always a tragedy, because we always fail. <laughs> but I think that internal goal is a really powerful part of the lasting appeal of Tetris. That sense of desiring order and it always chasing away from us. That's a very human experience, and I think that's one of the reasons it works as such an enduring appeal for us. So if you add that quickly into our diagram there, we have the, uh, the external motivation is uh, looking for change, usually expressed through very direct verbs like save and find and things like that. And internal is about overcoming or coming to terms with. So let's move on to plot structure. You've got your goals for your player character, external, internal motivations there. Now we need a well-structured series of events through which change will happen. The external goals are just a desire we need the plot to make that change happen. So uh, a plot controls the speed of progress through the, through the tension arc of the experience. And so I'm gonna be talking a little bit more in detail about how this plot works. So start your story before the big events begin. This is one thing that a lot of games fail to do properly. By this, I mean don't, you don't start your story with, you're a wizard, Harry. You have this whole part of meeting the Dursleys. You have his, his childhood, his, his normal everyday life outside of the wizard world before you, you, see the, you see kind of Hagrid come in, before you experience the world of magic. Because the world of magic by itself means nothing unless it's contrasted by the world of the ordinary. We see this sometimes in games, and when we do, it's very powerful. Prince of Persia, Sands of Time is one of my favorite storytelling games, and it's got a little snatch of normality at the very beginning of it. It's beautiful, really lovely game. So you set up your character, the situation, and the basic rules of this. This is otherwise known as a tutorial mission. You can do it that way. It's you can literally do it. Set it in a normal world. Call of Duty sometimes does this, that you train on the base before you go and shoot people who are ideologically opposed to you. So you, I wasn't going to do politics, I said I wouldn't. Um, so start your story before the events begin. Uh, it's really important to build empathy with your characters if possible. So we want to, the character to overcome the challenges ahead of us. Now a really great example of this I think is Firewatch. I think Firewatch did beautiful work with this. So before we reach the lake in Firewatch, which is really when the story begins to kick off and that tension starts, we know a lot about Harry. We, we know about his external and internal motivations and the story begins with that moment there that his external motivation is really kicked off by there's trouble in this park. So we've got this internal stuff, that growth, that need to escape. And we know at some point he's going to have to go back. It's a nice setup. It, it makes the rest of the game powerful. If we just started with that confrontation with the, the teenage women, uh, it probably wouldn't work so well. And then we have what we call the inciting incident. So now your player character knows their place in the world, we can start to set up the challenges for them. So we increase the narrative or mechanical tension here, and we add the antagonist or the enemies, the risk, or we, we break the usual situation. Something which was normal and everyday becomes less normal. Suddenly it stops working. See this in the Stanley parable, the button stops going. Overcoming this problem is usually the external motivation of your plot. Trying to find the source of that problem and, and 
bring it back into normality is usually what drives your main character. But to begin with, though, the player character avoids the problem. The player doesn't usually go straight to attacking the problem. They'll either explore their abilities, explore the world, they'll avoid the big issue that's facing them, or they'll have some smaller battles along the way. So in VVVVVV, uh, which I shall call Spikes from now on, uh, so in Spikes, the player character has to rescue their colleagues. It's a really lovely little game. It reminds me a lot of Jess at Willian. It's really a lovely little game. It's very, very fun. But to begin with, basically, the player wanders aimlessly. Really, that's what you do. You don't, you're not setting off, ah, I shall find everybody immediately. No, you go off and play, and you see what the kind of puzzles are in the world. Now, after a little while of exploration, they make a choice to act with intention. After a while, the player feels like they know the territory enough to make that focused choice to act, or there's no choice left but to act. You've done all the submissions, you have to go do a story one. In spikes, that means basically, I'd better use the map more. If you ever play the game, eventually you kind of go, oh, yeah, I'm lost, okay. What is this flashing elephant? Um, they engage with the external objective of the, the story or the world that's ahead of them. And that's when they really begin to kind of get into this. But as they get further into it, the complexity begins to increase. The abilities seem less effective, maybe. New enemies are added, which, may, which are more challenging. New story elements show that things were not so, not so simple as we thought they were to begin with. And I think Tetris is a masterpiece because of exactly this moment. <laughs> Suddenly, complexity has increased. And suddenly we know that there's going to be difficulty ahead and we're going to have to, our strategy of just piling things on top of each other is now a strategy of slipping things underneath just about quickly, move down, oh no. Suddenly the complexity has increased and this is a storytelling moment in itself. I think the complexity has to increase to make the experience compelling, otherwise it stays at this kind of flat level, the tension doesn't change. So that complexity can change through narrative terms, mechanical terms, or through both. I like both, if you can, but you can just do it with narrative. I think that's a really valid way of doing it if you're making purely narrative games. So in Virginia, we see divisions between the protagonists, and the dreams begin to call some of reality into question, and this is a complexification of the everyday setting that we, we'd gone into. In Firewatch, an extra layer of conspiracy has added is there's not just missing women, there's some other stuff going on in the park, and it all gets a bit, ooh, it's cool, I love that game. In my own game, fragments of him, uh, Will's kind of been trying to build a, a, a big long-term relationship, and halfway through, he begins to doubt whether he can stay in a relationship without hurting other people. It's a big, doubtful moment, and this is, this is kind of a, the, the, the low midpoint of most stories. So the first strategies and weapons are no longer enough, usually. In shooters, new patterns and combinations of enemies are added. Uh, something like Super Stardust tends to add in new things halfway through. Enemies use a better targeting, more bullets or homing missiles. Enemies begin to, begin to kind of get dangerous new abilities, like moving faster or tracking you. In Left 4 Dead, you would not throw these things at the player as soon as they walk out the door. It's just natural, isn't it? And that's what I mean. This, some of these patterns are intuitive to us. We just know it wouldn't be a good idea. Then hope overcomes fear with some effort. Player finds new weapons or strategies to overcome the enemies. The external change happens. They get power-ups or grinding. This is kind of the, uh, the, the weapon montage and the training montage in a film. They find the strength they never knew they had. They have that moment of internal change, which I think Life is Strange does so well with Kate's story. And the character learns to unite their skills and teams behind a single purpose. It has high risks. There's danger ahead now. Before it was just fun, but now there's danger in facing these things. But it is their only hope to continue. Getting guns, lots of guns. And then we get to the black moment. All hopes of overcoming the problem are at risk. The final boss is killed, but it's not even its final form. Oh my God. It's, it's this kind of moment that the escalating danger seems too much. And all the knowledge, the relationships, the strategies developed through the player character experience are needed to overcome this final challenge, the final choice, the heartbreaking relationships you've built along the way are all at risk now. And what choice will you make about the future? It's a powerful moment, the black moment. Very, very important in your story. And then you end it as fast as possible. People often say, how long should my ending be? You say, you do it as quickly as you possibly can. And you keep the ending neat and short, wrapping up as many of the threads as you possibly can, as easily as you can. So let's add all of that to our diagram. Okay. 
So we're going to start off with our before it begins moment. We get to our inciting incident where we kind of have a need for change. But the character kind of tries to avoid it, thinks it's somebody else's problem. And then they kind of get to that statement of external objective. Yes, I will face up to this. Yes, I will use the map more and find my, my colleagues. They try this. Uh, they, they try these kind of things, and it's not really working. We get to the low midpoint. They're going to have to get better. They're going to have to find new ways of dealing with these kind of things. Training montage. People begin to power up. People grind their characters a little bit more to get their high things. We get some hope entering into the story. Maybe if I keep on doing this, if I get better at this game, I'll overcome these challenges. Then we get to this, uh, this moment of, of, of building up, the, the, the everybody assembles behind this one plan which is going to push us forwards. When we reach the black moment where all is at risk, and maybe just with enough skill, with enough of the things that we saved along the way, we can overcome, and we have the final satisfying conclusion. Cool, you may have noticed there's a bit missing at the beginning and the end there, because that's the model for most stories. As a player's character journey, this fits most strong experiences. A lot of films you see will follow this model pretty much exactly. It works on an intuitive and emotional level to feel very rewarding, but if you're making a thriller, an action, or a horror story, you might want to add an extra little bit on there. Horror stories in particular do this one. There's an additional bit of structure you might want to consider adding at the very beginning, which is called the grabber. It's a burst of action or fear that promises for the future of the game and slows down before the inciting incident. So it's a way to let the player character know there's going to be excitement ahead, and then you give them a bit of breathing space later on. For example, this is the Metroid games, where you end up with loads of great powers at the beginning, and then they take them away and kind of go, OK, let's let you build those up slowly now. Or the uh, Goblet of Fire. You get this moment of horror at the beginning, and you know it's going to have another moment of horror later on. And sure enough, a teenager is killed in cold blood at the very end. That's a... Spoilers, sorry. Uh, but it's... It's, it's a way of telling us that there's going to be something coming along. Deus Ex does this with, with all the abilities at the beginning, takes them away, slower paced a bit after that. Star Trek, J.J. Abrams. You've got death, you've got love, you've got birth, you've got sacrifice, you've got amazing stuff, not the first five minutes of the film. Um, really, J.J. Abrams is a master of the grab. It's a very important thing, I think, for if you're going to do that kind of stuff. In horror stories, you often also have a final moment of fear at the end, which is called Evil Lurks. Da, da, da. So in Carrie, this is when the, the hand comes up from beneath the, the earth and grabs her, and this kind of thing. It's the nightmares at the end of a rent horizon. But also, you sometimes have this in thrillers where the organization perhaps wasn't quite defeated. So in Austin Powers, Dr. Evil escapes. You know, this is a fairly common kind of structure that we do with this. Or the end of Kill Zone 2, where you've killed the big boss. Oh my God, it's brilliant. The war is over. You walk outside, and the war's still going. Oh, evil lurks. There'll be Kill Zone 3. So we'll just add those quickly at the beginning and the end of that structure. There we go. So we've described this so far, this nice smooth curve in here. The diagram explains the player character journey pretty nicely there. Uh, it could be applied literally to help write an in-game story, or as a metaphorical structure to shape tension in a compelling mechanics-driven experience. Whichever way you want to do it, this kind of structure works on an emotional way. So we can also sort of set it out like this. This model works as a meta structure for the entire game, but it also you can do it on a smaller level. It can repeat on a level by level basis, uh, with each little bit of the level contributing to kind of the uh, d journey towards that external internal motivation. Uh, this is what I did on Aliens vs Predator, for example. Every level of that has a full story inside it, as well as contributing to the full story of the game. But that's too much detail for each encounter or scene. So if you want to make a good scene to, be, to, to work with that, we need a little, little simpler, shorter guide for that. Basically, we want to turn this into that kind of knobbly version. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we do this with scene structure. It's the final part of that diagram we're going to add in there. So all scenes on your level must have an objective, which is the player's target goal or experience. It must have conflict, something that makes the objective more difficult to reach. It's like uh, this can be either na narrative or mechanics or both, some sort of conflict that makes us struggle, or makes it harder for us to make these things happen. And then an outcome is reached by requiring change from the player or the character. So they either resolve or adapt to the conflict, building to the next part of the experience of the story, and the story goes on with escalating tension there. And you get these nice little peaks of, oh, I'm going to make it. Oh, no, that wasn't what I expected. Oh, no, yeah. You get these little tension arcs coming all the way, along the way there. So this was the lead character from Aliens vs. Predator. I was a writer on this one. 
uh, one of the first objectives you get is to reset the, the colony uh, powers to, to make it work again. The conflict is that the, power, the player successfully resets the power, but it blows the circuits across the colony. So the colony is actually more at risk before, and the character's life is more complex. Now notice here that the player succeeded whilst the character failed. So you can still have player success as long as you signpost, well done, you've done the right thing, your player's life now sucks even more. That's perfectly fine. In fact, I thoroughly encourage you to do that as often as possible, because if your character's life is easy, their, their story is usually pretty boring. So try and play with this kind of stuff as much as you can. So another example from this might be the God, might be God of War series, where the objective is to continue killing everything. Uh, and then you have the conflict, which is he gets enemies with shields, which block the usual attacks. And so the player has to start using new attacks to progress, making the game more challenging. The complexity increases for the player. The character has not changed. The character just wants to keep on killing everything. So here we see again that we've got, we've got that escalating little peak and trough in a scene, but it's working the other way around for the, for the player's complexity this time. So let's add that in there. So we have our objective, we have our conflict, and we have our outcome. This will be on the final slides. You don't need to go, dink, and I'm going to change it now. Ha, too late. Um, so games are players' stories. So if your game feels flat, then think of your, your player's experience as a story. is a good way of debugging it. Think about what they're experiencing as they're going through it. So here are four debug questions to ask that, uh, in a game, event, or level feels unsatisfying. And I'm going to put a diagram of this at the very end as well. Okay. Uh, is the player's objective clear? Is there an escalating mechanical or narrative conflict? Or is it only repetition? Have we done this before? Does the outcome meaningfully add to the mechanics, the narrative, or both? And over the whole game, was there change from start to finish for the player, the character, or both? That change is a really key thing to making your game experience feel good. Really, really important thing. So I'm just going to conclude this, wrapping this all up now. Good designers already intuitively use story structures to create compelling and rewarding games. Learning to do so consciously, though, I think is a powerful way of understanding how we shape great experiences. Using stories consciously, understanding this tension arc that people go through, that it is peaks and troughs, not a straight line, is a really important thing to do. So whether your game is narrative or mechanics-oriented, learning to think like a storyteller helps you make intelligent, player-focused design choices. I hope you found this talk interesting and useful. Get in touch if you want to know more. Uh, please leave comments with a review after the session. I do read all the comments that you put in there. Those are awesome. So I'm going to show those two diagrams after the next slide. So I'm going to say thank you one, then I'll show the two diagrams, and you can all take photos and stuff like that. Um, before that, I want to just say have fun, make great games, and please tell some great stories. And thank you so much for listening. 29 minutes, 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs>